My name is Rachel Elnor Love and in this video I'm going to explain to you how the new East Midlands Mayor could really <laughs> your life. This video is essential viewing if you live in Derbyshire or Nottinghamshire, which are the two counties being invited to vote for the new East Midlands Mayor on 2nd May 2024. What about Leicestershire and the other counties which make up the East Midlands region, you may be asking? Well, not all councils were stupid enough to take up the offer to be part of this new regional authority, for reasons which I'll explain later. You may well also be fascinated to watch this video if you live in one of the eight other regions around the UK where local mayors are being voted in, as your life could similarly be affected. It is the government's stated intention to introduce these new regional authorities all across the UK over time. Let me explain what is going on in simple terms. The government wishes to insert a new layer of regional government called a combined county authority in between Westminster and the existing local councils. They are calling this new layer of government devolution deals, but the truth is that all the locally elected councillors are actually giving away their power to determine the future of their region to this new layer of authority, which is why some councils, like Leicestershire, have refused to sign on the dotted line. The carrot being dangled by the government to the East Midlands is 38 million per annum of extra funding across 30 years. That's a total of 1.14 billion extra investment for the region. Sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Lovely, shiny new mayor and a big pot of money to spend to improve the lives of the local people. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, so, Let's take a look at who signed on the dotted line in the Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire region. And these details are easy to research if you live in any of the other regional mayor areas via just a few search engine clicks. First, we have Councillor Barry Lewis, leader of the Derbyshire County Council, who is conservative. Then there is Councillor Ben Bradley, also MP for Mansfield, also standing for East Midlands Mayor, also the Con Party. Derby City Council signed up when they were still under Con Party rule under Councillor Chris Poulter, but Labour now have the most seats in that region, although no overall control. So the new council leader, Baggy Shankar, is Labour. Nottingham City Council is also Labour controlled. Each one of these council leaders gets a seat on the newly formed combined county authority with one vote each. The final seat and vote goes to the newly elected mayor, who also importantly has the power of veto. I'll come back to the importance of that later. But just for now, please be aware that the four seats on the combined county authority are very much conservative Labour and as George Galloway described them in his recent by-election win acceptance speech as two cheeks of the same arse. Okay, so let's take a look at the finances of all the councils who have agreed to this East Midlands region devolution deal. Derbyshire County Council is currently 46 million in the red. Nottinghamshire County Council is facing a forecast deficit of 60.2 million. Interesting then, isn't it, that Ben Bradley in his mayor campaign is proposing to use part of the new funding to fix all the potholes in the roads in the Nottinghamshire region. But fixing potholes is one of the council's normal day-to-day -day responsibilities. Ben Bradley can't do that currently though because he is sitting in such a huge financial pothole of his own council's financial mismanagement. 
Turning now to Nottingham City Council, they are 50 million in the red. And Derby City Council has just hiked council tax to the maximum it is able to charge legally to avoid going into the red, despite the fact that the people are already suffering hugely with the cost of living crisis. So it's not really surprising that all four of these councils took the bait of this 1.14 billion devolution deal. In order to explain to you the very real dangers of these devolution deals, first I need to give you a bit of background. My name is Rachel Elnor Love, and I am the entrepreneur who created the experiences brand Red Letter Days back in 1989 at the age of 24, having spent the first six years of my working life in accountancy, specialising in the taxation of entrepreneurs and small businesses. I built Red Letter Days on a shoestring budget into a multi-million turnover market-leading brand, which led to me winning business awards and also starring as a dragon on the first two series of BBC TV's Dragon's Den. But in 2005, Red Letter Days was forced into administration by Barclays Bank, 16 years after I founded it, despite us having 3.3 million cash at bank. So during those two decades, I learned a huge amount about how to build a business, as well as experiencing the levels of greed and corruption which abound in the world of banking and corporate finance. And as a result of my Dragon's Den fame, I went on to become a business speaker, author and mentor, attending many big corporate conferences, as well as assisting thousands of small business owners on their journey to success. Suffice it to say, I have a huge amount of experience in the business world. I know how challenging life can be when you are just starting out. And I also have a great deal of insight into how the world of big corporations works. In September 2020, my life took a transformational turn when I went out into the fields near where I used to live in Yulegrave, Derbyshire, and filmed a 27-minute rant about the latest round of COVID lockdown restrictions insanity, especially as I could see how the government was destroying local independent businesses. The video was called Rachel Speaks Out and went viral, getting around 250,000 views before it was deleted by both YouTube and Facebook. Many people still thank me for that video as I was saying exactly what they were thinking, that the whole pandemic was a scam and that there was something much more sinister behind it. So as a result of the overwhelming response to that video, I decided to use my business and accountancy skills to research exactly what was going on. At the time, many of the world's political leaders were all using the same catchphrases, build back better and the great reset. I traced these phrases back to the World Economic Forum, an unelected organisation whose members comprise the CEOs of practically every big corporation in the world, along with many high-profile entrepreneurs and celebrities. One of the World Economic Forum's most infamous future forecast slogans is, you will own nothing and be happy. I got hold of the book, The Great Reset, co-written by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Malloray and I read it with interest. I could immediately tell that it was a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, around the alleged pandemic. And I also knew from my business experience that there must be a second book, a manual of strategies and implementation, which only the governments worldwide who were in lockstep implementing these plans were allowed to see. It was quite apparent to me 
that the World Economic Forum was offering huge funding, especially to third world governments, to implement their COVID agenda plans. This money disguised as grants and aid. There were also significant incentives in the form of financial support provided to doctors and hospitals for every death which they diagnosed as a COVID death. The book was quite incredible given that it was researched, written and published in record time on 9th July 2020 and was uncannily accurate in forecasting exactly what would happen in 2021 and 2022 with the lightning speed experimental injection solution plus rollout. Either Klaus Schwab had a very effective crystal ball or this was all premeditated and pre-planned. It was also interesting to look into the part the World Health Organization, another unelected body, was playing in the whole COVID charade, whose recommendations, for example, not breathing fresh air, seemed to me to have very little to do with health and everything to do with creating maximum fear. Indeed, it was apparent from the SAGE reports leaked here in the UK that the levels of behavioural psychology deployed to convince people to obey all the lockdown rules and regulations were MK Ultra military grade mind manipulation. It was clear to me as I delved deeper and deeper that something very sinister was going on. The plot thickened even further when I took a look at the World Economic Forum's strategic partners, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Reuters, who feed many of the world's news headlines, amongst other things, Google, which owns YouTube, and Facebook. Also interesting, when I researched who were the funders of some of the trusted authorities who were being quoted in the scientific research, organisations like Imperial College London and Johns Hopkins University received huge funding from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And don't forget, all of the world's mainstream media is either owned or funded by World Economic Forum aligned big corporations, along with all of the fact checkers. As they say in business, follow the money. And it was apparent that the COVID era resulted in bumper years for all those big corporates involved. Billionaires got 54% richer. Pfizer's revenues soared to over $100 billion dollars And the richest 1% grabbed twice as much new wealth as the rest of the world put together, according to Oxfam. Pandemics are clearly big business. No wonder they were silencing people like me, along with so many doctors and scientists who were speaking out to question what was going on. And given the amount of money at stake, Is it any wonder that the World Health Organization now has a whole stack of scary new potential future pandemics in store for us, including the mysterious disease X, for which they are already miraculously concocting a cure, even though no one knows what the disease is yet? They also want every country in the world to sign up to their new pandemic treaty which would essentially create an unelected one world government. This is very dangerous for every person in this country as the Prime Minister has already declared his party's intention that the UK should be part of it. The other eye-opener in my research was discovering that many of the world's political leaders responsible for some of the harshest and most brutal COVID lockdowns, were groomed through the World Economic Forum Young Leaders Programme. These included Justin Trudeau in Canada, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand and Emmanuel Macron in France. 
So not only does the World Economic Forum wield power and influence over all the world's big corporations, it has its tentacles in governments worldwide. Not forgetting that the mainstream UK political parties also receive substantial funding from those same World Economic Forum aligned big corporations. With all of this in mind, let's now take a look at the big new areas of strategic importance according to the World Economic Forum. Here's where it gets interesting with regard to all these new mayors and the new regional combined county authorities which are currently being created. Heading the World Economic Forum list of bumper new profit opportunities are artificial intelligence, and this includes facial recognition and robotic policing, by the way, along with what they call climate change mitigation technology. And bear in mind, around 3,000 of the rich and powerful so-called elites, including many politicians, make the pilgrimage to the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland every year, many flying in by private jet to discuss such market growth strategies and then dictating to us how we need to cut down on our carbon emissions and switch to electric cars. Everyone now seems completely sold on this idea that the world is going to end if we don't take drastic action, just like they warned us back in 2020 that if we didn't obey with all the lockdown diktats, that grandma was going to die. But where exactly did this climate emergency notion come from? Do you remember Greta Thunberg, a schoolgirl who suddenly went from obscurity to becoming the poster child of said climate emergency worldwide, featured on the covers of all those big corporation-owned magazines? She famously ranted, you have stolen my dreams and my childhood at the UN Climate Summit back in 2019. We now know from the COVID debacle that there are plenty of World Economic Forum bankrolled scientists who will happily back up whatever new strategic business plan the World Economic Forum wishes to roll out. And whatever your views on climate change, all I will say is that this isn't the first time in history that a young girl in Platts has been used to drive home propaganda. If you live in or ever drive through London, you will have an inkling of just how huge and horrific what started out as a simple congestion charge 20 years ago has now become. A recent Freedom of Information request revealed that in 2022, London's ULES scheme, Ultra Low Emission Zone, drained £224 million from the pockets of the people in charges and penalty fees. Make no mistake, this so-called climate emergency is big business not just in the fines and charges it generates, but also the huge cost of actually investing in the infrastructure. It now transpires that London's Mayor Sadiq Khan is investing a further £150 million in additional road surveillance technology, which also has the capability of enforcing pay-per-mile road charging. That's before we even consider the massive revenues being generated for big corporations as a result of the enforced switch to electric vehicles, now predicted to be half of global car sales by 2035. However, owners of electric vehicles report a litany of challenges, including short battery life, queues at charging stations, 
Huge bills as a result of skyrocketing electricity prices, lithium battery fires and failures, along with prohibitive insurance premiums. Worries also abound that the new fleet of NHS electric ambulances is not only ridiculously expensive, they will also threaten patient safety for many of the same reasons. Another strategy being rolled out by the World Economic Forum is the 15-minute city. The sound of having everything available within 15 minutes of your home sounds like a great one until you realise that the plan is to fine you if you leave your designated zone more than the number of times the authorities deem sufficient per year to ensure that you are not damaging the environment. All of these World Economic Forum initiatives are why city mayors have already popped up all over the world, claiming to be united in action to confront the climate crisis. And please do visit the website C40 Cities if you don't believe me. It's all part of what is known as Agenda 2030. Far-reaching policies which will affect every single one of us if we allow them to be bulldozed through. Not just restricting our rights to travel, but also placing other onerous responsibilities on us. For example... Landlords being required to retrofit properties with energy-saving heating or else being prohibited from letting them. Or homeowners unable to sell properties unless they are compliant with new climate emergency legislation. Sandy Adams is a leading expert on Agenda 2030 and its devastating implications on all of us. Her website spells it all out very simply and in great detail. Please do visit www.sandyadams.net to get a measure of the full horror of what is coming for us if we do not derail it. And of course, all the main political parties are now fully bought into the climate emergency propaganda. Conservatives, Labour, Lib Dems and Greens. If you were still labouring under the illusion that Keir Starmer is a man of the people, here's what he said when BBC TV's Emily Maitlis asked him whether his loyalty was to Westminster or to Davos. Let's ask you quickly, you have to choose now between Davos or Westminster. Davos. Why? <laughs> because Westminster is too constrained. Um, and, you know, it's closed and we're not having meaning. Once you get out of Westminster, whether it's Davos or anywhere else, you actually engage with people um, that you can see working with in the future. Westminster is just a, a tribal shouting place. It's clear that the Labour Party, like the Con Party, are now fully sold out to their big corporate backers. So, with all of that intel on the bigger picture, let's return to the East Midlands mayor election happening on the 2nd of May 2024. The creation of a new combined county authority, all of those cash-strapped councils already dominated by the red and blue mainstream parties, all desperately looking for ways to find new revenue streams, together with the huge carrot of 1.14 billion funding being dangled to them. Now here's some of the detail from the government's 32-page devolution deal. And I've given the link here at .gov.uk so you can read the whole document if you want to. The government commits to using the platform of this deal to work with the East Midlands mayoral combined county authority in addressing key local challenges and opportunities, including the delivery of infrastructure and investment to build the transport network of the future, tackling productivity and skills gaps to support inclusive economic growth in towns, cities and rural areas, unlocking transformative 
regeneration and housing opportunities, and working together to tackle climate change on our journey to 2030. In other words, this is all part of the implementation of Agenda 2030. The implications of the planned massive capital investment in this digital surveillance and command control technology potentially include clean air zones like ULES in all of the major towns and cities in the Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire regions, more bus lanes and more parking restrictions and more automatic number plate recognition digital surveillance, which all equals more fines. 15-minute cities, fines if you exceed your allowed number of trips outside your zone per annum, pay per mile charging, climate lockdowns as and when the authorities see fit, and digital lockdowns for a myriad of other reasons, for example, pandemics as determined by the World Health Organization. So, We, the people, need to be extremely cautious around what seems, on the face of it, to be a very generous devolution deal by our wonderful, benevolent government. It is anything but. However, the whole plan has got an Achilles heel. Firstly, For such a massive change to the constitution of the UK to become legal, it requires the consent of the people. That's why they have included the role of a new mayor in the deal and are asking for we the people to vote on it. By voting for the new mayor, we are effectively offering our consent to the whole devolution deal. Secondly, the mayor has the power of veto meaning that the mayor can block any of the World Economic Forum-inspired digital command control schemes. This power of veto is why I was originally inspired to announce that I would be running for election as East Midlands mayor back in January 2024. Imagine appointing a mayor who would devote the entire 1.14 billion devolution deal funding to local community projects chosen by the local people, ensuring that all monies were spent with local independent businesses, and a mayor who would veto all World Economic Forum command control projects. However, since announcing my intention to stand for election, back in January 2024, here is what I have since discovered. Firstly, that it costs a huge amount just to get on the ballot paper for one of these new regional mayor roles compared to a general election. To stand for election as an MP, a Member of Parliament, costs £500. To stand for election as East Midlands Mayor costs £5,000, and this money is only refunded if you get 5% of the votes, which is roughly 26,400 votes. Plus, a further 5000 is being demanded on top of the 5000 deposit to be featured in the booklet of candidates. And on top of this, there's an allowed amount for marketing and promotion of £142,217, an amount well out of the range of an independent candidate standing on behalf of the rights of the people, but money easily within the reach of the mainstream political parties with their multi-million pound big corporate backers. To raise the bar even higher, 100 nominations from members of the electorate are needed. By way of comparison, you only need two nominations to stand for a local election. Now, 10 of these nominations must each be from a different council area. 
And again, this is an easy hurdle to jump if you're part of a big political party network and can simply ask all your area campaign managers to send you the required number of local nominations. But by far the biggest factor which prevents this from being a free and fair election is the complete media blackout which I have personally experienced. Firstly, an update to Wikipedia was reversed to remove my name from the running. Despite communicating with local journalists, I received no coverage nor invitations to any of the televised hustings which were organised, nor to my knowledge has my name been mentioned in any newspaper articles with the exception of one hit piece which eventually appeared in Derbyshire Times on 28 February 2024, implying that I was under Derbyshire police investigation, insinuating that I was a business failure who had threatened violence and suggesting that I was far right in my views. All familiar smears against anyone who speaks out against the system. And there was also a complete refusal by Ed Dingwall, who wrote the article, to use my legal and lawful name of Rachel Elnor Love. I do have compassion for Ed Dingwall, the journalist concerned though, given that morale at the newspaper's big corporate owner, National World, is apparently at rock bottom due to the level of redundancies being experienced at the company. I guess anyone who doesn't toe the editorial line is the first to get booted out. And I guess that morale is always going to be at rock bottom when you work for Satan. One of the principles of democracy is that for an election to be considered free and fair, there need to be numerous opportunities for the electorate to receive objective information from a free press. And another is that there must be freedom for any member of the public to stand for election. It is my view that the government has deliberately made the hurdles for this election impossibly high for any candidate other than from a mainstream political party, combined with a media highly controlled by big corporate interests dictating the narrative, specifically to ensure that only a World Economic Forum aligned candidate has any chance of being elected. Accordingly, I have written to the returning officer stating that this is not a free and fair election, and that I have decided to run a shadow campaign, recommending that members of the electorate write, I do not consent, across their ballot paper. This is deemed as a spoiled ballot and has to be countered and declared by the returning officer. Now, many people believe that it is an act of defiance to not bother to vote, but the truth is that silence is deemed as tacit consent, which is why it is so important, if you feel, as I do, that this election is corrupt to actively say so. Now, here are the statistics for the East Midlands region. There are 2.2 million residents only 1.6 million are actually on the electoral roll. Now, let's say that the likely turnout is 33%, which is typical for a local council election. That's 528,000 ballot papers cast. And the number of spoiled ballot papers on an average level across elections is 0.5%, which is 2,640. Now, interestingly, here are the reasons why most people don't vote, according to research by the Electoral Commission. 18% say that they didn't have time, they're too busy or busy at work. 11% say they're just not interested in politics or they're fed up with politics. 
9% said there's no point in voting because it was obvious who would win. My vote wouldn't have made a difference to the outcome and that my vote doesn't count. 8% said they were away on voting day. 7% said they didn't like the candidates, the parties, and they didn't represent my views. Now, interestingly, that's a total of 53%. The Electoral Commission don't say what the other 47% had a problem with. So there is a, a big gap in the statistics. But just imagine here, if you are one of the 67%, which is a, over a million people who wouldn't normally bother to vote for any one of that myriad of reasons, what if just one in 10 of you wrote, I do not consent across your ballot paper? That would equal 100,000 spoiled ballot papers which would make the election null and void. This is why I am encouraging you to join with me in writing, I do not consent across your ballot paper on 2nd May 2024. Let's sabotage this corrupt election. In doing so, we send a message to Westminster that we do not consent to the World Economic Forum's digital, totalitarian command control Agenda 2030 plans being bulldozed through by a government which is acting solely in the interests of its big corporate backers. Especially, please do share this video with anyone who you know who lives in the Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire counties, as the only way this message will get to the people is via word of mouth. Let's not allow the new East Midlands mayor to fuck up <laughs> our lives. If this video is deleted by YouTube, it is backed up to my Odyssey channel and you can retrieve all the information from my website www.rachelelnord.com forward slash love hyphen East hyphen Midlands. Thank you for listening and sending you so much love.